Yes, welcome to this evening's meeting of Edinburgh, Edinburgh Bibliographical Society. Um, thank you for coming. We are still on Zoom, um, which is probably inevitable, the way, thing, the, way the world is, um, but we hope that we'll be back live by our Christmas meeting. But we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the meeting. Um, so this evening, we are going to be hearing from Jessica Bidol um, from a copy shop to the archives towards the provenance of a manuscript copy of Le Nozze di Figaro at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. Jessica um, is an alumna of the MSc in Material Culture and History of the Book um, at Edinburgh University, graduating in 2020. She holds degrees in musicology from the University of California, Los Angeles and California State University, and a law degree from the University of Southern California. While she was in Edinburgh for her History of the Book book course, um, she was sent on a work placement at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland in Glasgow. While there, she met a manuscript of Mozart's Marriage of Figaro with a mysterious provenance. She used this manuscript as the basis of her dissertation for the course, and it is about this, um, this book that tonight's paper is based. Jessica is currently living in Los Angeles and working in business immigration law, but has every intention of returning to Scotland to continue her research into this mysterious manuscript. So I will now hand over to Jessica and technical support and hope that everything will proceed from here. <laughs> Welcome, Jessica. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, so I believe everyone should be able to see my, um, my presentation now. Um, I can't see questions, so I'm assuming I'll be able to see them after I um, close the slideshow. Um, okay. So I got a little creative before when I was writing the um, presentation. So the title's a little different here, but the content is still the same. Um, so let's get started. <laughs> An opera buffa or a comic opera in four acts, La Noce di Figaro was composed by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart to libretto by Lorenzo da Ponte after Pierre Augustin Beaumarchais' play. Um, I'm just gonna go with the marriage of Figaro because my French pronunciation isn't great. Um, which premiered in Paris in 1784. The opera disseminated quickly at first and then more slowly throughout Europe, only reaching the stage in London in 1812 in a significantly altered format. Sometime between the early 19th century and the mid 20th century, a full manuscript copy of the opera made its way to the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. This manuscript languished in the Special Collections Department at the University of Glasgow, uh, for 17 years until January 2020, when I accompanied Stuart Harris Logan, the keeper of the RCS archives, in retrieving it and bringing it back to the archive. To our best knowledge, this manuscript has received no attention beyond a brief inquiry from Rupert Ridgewell, a curator of printed music at the British Library in 2002, which was when the manuscript had been moved from, to the University of Glasgow on deposit for safekeeping by the conservatoire. The goal of this talk is to present my findings from a study of the provenance of RCS Figaro, which I conducted in 2020 as the topic of my MSc dissertation for the University of Edinburgh's Book History and Material Culture Program. For this study, I examined the manuscript's physical characteristics, including its paper, watermarks, and musical and textual handwriting. I also did what I could to examine the contents of the score, although this entire endeavor, the pandemic made uh, some limitations because I was only able to conduct the study using a series of iPhone photos I had taken of the manuscripts between January and March of 2020. I use the considerations here to come to the tentative conclusion that the manuscript was likely copied in Italy within the first few decades of the 19th century. 
The score illuminates Scotland's involvement and interest in Italian opera and how Italian opera manuscripts reached Scotland during the 19th century, a subject that draws significantly less scholarly attention than Scotland's folk music and book history traditions. RCS Figaro has prompted enough intriguing questions to merit a long form study. Uh, the study that I have conducted is the foundation upon which may rest future study of the manuscript, um, the, mu the music manuscript trade, and the flow of music manuscripts from the continent to Scotland during the 19th and early 20th centuries. And of course, while I discuss my findings, I will share as many photos of this beautifully preserved manuscript as I can. So it might be difficult to see here, but I'm actually trying to show a, a close up of one of the watermarks here. It'll come back, uh, but I later in the presentation, but um, I thought it'd be good to get an idea. It's supposed to be the outline of either an eagle or a phoenix, and it's towards the middle of the page. As I stated earlier, I focus primarily on the physical aspects of this manuscript, although the musical contents can also yield important information about who, where, and why the manuscript was copied. One of the aspects of the manuscript that can potentially provide the most information are the watermarks. Bibliographers began producing watermark catalogs in the first half of the 20th century, based on studies of historical paper in libraries and archives around Europe. These catalogs are useful for getting an idea of regional and historical practice in watermark creation, but they're also extremely li limited in scope as watermarks vary based on the paper size and whether it was destined for print or manuscript. Additionally, study of watermarks in music manuscript paper has been very limited. Musicologists have hesitated to accept the time consuming process of watermark analysis because it often cannot offer better than a five-year window of when the paper was produced or used. However, this has not prevented some scholars from urging watermarks um, not be dismissed as a useful tool in bibliographical study. In 2001, musicologist Jan LaRue encouraged fellow music scholars to study watermarks, arguing that they allow for a chain of reasoning culminating in a form of proof even if the watermarks themselves do not offer direct proof. Since then, the study of watermarks has continued in a small scale with areas of study that tend to encompass different regions, eras, and types of historical papers. For example, there has been extensive study of watermarks in the paper used by Beethoven and Mozart to ascertain when certain pieces uh, were composed, especially in the case of Mo uh, Beethoven, who constantly started, stopped, sketched, and doodled melodies on various scraps of paper before he completed a given work, if he completed it at all. While general knowledge of watermarks has expanded considerably, one must also bear in mind the purpose of the paper catalogs. The most recent watermark catalog to be released is Theo and Franz Laurentius's uh, Italian Watermarks, 1750 to 1860 which concentrates primarily on dating watermarks and letters from administrative bodies and ecclesiastical institutions. While it may initially be considered useful to examine this book against the RCS Figaro, one must also keep in mind the different destinies of the types of, uh, and sizes of papers yielded in papermaking process. Music manuscript paper was manufactured in the large royal size which is significantly larger than paper meant to become letters. This would render many watermark catalogs useless. Efforts to date early music paper have generally concentrated on printed music, which has resulted in a sparse landscape of watermarks against which this manuscript can be matched. In fact, in pushing for musicologists to continue investigating watermarks on historic music paper, one scholar only dedicates one page to manuscripts and four pages to printed music. That said, papermakers created their own marks to trademark their work, so it may be possible to reliably trace certain papers and makers based on an understanding of the papermaker's region, the size of the paper, and whether the paper was meant for print or manuscript. The study of musical watermarks from the 18th and 19th centuries to date to date manuscripts was renewed by Alan Tyson in the 1980s 
when he successfully challenged previous datings of Mozart autographs that relied solely on the manuscript's musical content. Tyson's analytical method and catalog of watermarks in Mozart's known autographs influenced Dexter Edge's methodology in his 2001 PhD dissertation, Mozart's Athenian's Copyists. Edge compiled previous scholars' most effective approaches to systematically analyze watermarks and handwriting to identify Viennese copy shops for Mozart's works. He directs the researcher to treat the manuscript as a primary source, investigating the physical properties of the paper, ink, and notation to distinguish its paper type, along with the different contributing hands. Combining these observations with direct and circumstantial evidence regarding the musical and textual content of a manuscript, Edge argued, can lead to clues on a manuscript's origins. The methodology I use closely follows Edge's. I'll begin with an observation of the RCS Figaro's present physical states and then outline a brief Figaro, uh, provide a brief outline on Figaro's dissemination throughout Europe. Next, I will examine the watermarks, handwriting, and contents of the score. RCS Figaro is a performance score that is divided by act into four volumes. The reason we know it's a performance score is because the manuscript contains the entire opera with its full instrumentation, vocal parts, and stage directions. It's not in its original binding, as you can see here, um, as its current binding of green buckram is contemporary to the SAM faculty stamped uh, in the manuscript, which I'll show next. It was likely rebound during the 20th century. The score is in Italian, as the opera is, and it contains some English translations written in pencil above the lyrics, which I will also show briefly. So the conservatoire has gone through a variety of name changes throughout its existence. While there are no records of the RCS's acquisition of the manuscript, the Scottish National Academy of Music stamps in each volume of the manuscript indicate that it was likely acquired sometime between 1929 and 1944, when the Royal Conservatoire bore that name. This leaves only a 15 year span within which the RCS would have acquired the manuscript. Uh, there are at least two different papers present. The most predominant paper is thick with no ink bleed, while the other is thinner and shows some ink bleed. And here I, it's a little difficult uh, to demonstrate the difference in the paper thickness through only visual means. But as you can see here, this is most likely a photo of a page with significant ink bleed, which indicates it is likely one of the thinner papers. This was, by the way, this was very difficult to note to note, or sorry, this is very easy to notice in person because the, thin, the thicker paper was much heavier than the thinner paper. Both papers are very durable for even after only 200 years, they only exhibit slight change in color from white to off-white or slightly yellowish. These qualities were common in high quality Northern Italian paper of the 18th and 19th centuries whereas paper manufactured in other regions degraded in different manners. Uh, for example, Bohemian paper had a slightly lumpy finish and German paper would be dark brown with a rough finish. And this paper was not lumpy at all, it was very smooth. Uh, further indication of the paper size, weight, quality, and method of manufacture may indicate the specific paper manufacturer or part of Northern Italy in which the paper was made. There's other non-contemporary alterations to the score that include the potential removal of pages taped into one volume. And on, on the bottom picture there, you can see penciled English translations in act one and act two. Unfortunately, I don't have which acts this is in, um, both of which you can see here. So the RCS Figaro was copied with the quill pen using iron gall ink which was common during the 18th and 19th centuries. The progressive discoloration common in aging iron gall ink is visible in the reddish yellowish brown of RCS Figaro ink. Further evidence of this being iron gall ink is in the corrections. Iron gall ink penetrates paper deeply so that corrections can only be made by wiping the paper 
while the ink is still wet or scraping the mistake with a knife after the ink dried. And if you can see in the lower left-hand corner, just beneath uh, the staves that have been crossed off, there's some smudging and scraping. Uh, that's evidence of a note that someone noticed a mistake and scratched it off and then wrote the correction next to it. And then they weren't sure if the person would know what the correction was, so they wrote a B next to it as well, or B flat, I should say. Um, you can also see here the staves or the sets of five lines where the music was notated. Between the staves in the manuscript, uh, because the staves in the manuscript are relatively uniform, they were likely rolled with a full page rastrum set varyingly to either 10 or 12 staves per page. The staves are inked with iron gall ink watered down, so it did not appear as dark as the notation placed upon it, uh, which is long a common practice in creating manuscripts. So just a brief history on the play in the opera. Uh, Figaro was born into the hotbed of political unrest of late 18th century Paris. It is the second in a trilogy of plays all of which were adapted to opera and scandalized Paris. The marriage of Figaro depicts the scheming and machinations of the servants and the nobles against each other as Figaro and Susanna, his bride, prepare for their wedding day. Count Almaviva, uh, Figaro's uh, employer, uh, has been married to Rosina for three years, but is besotted with Susanna, Rosina's maid and Figaro's bride, and hopes to invoke Prima Noctis. Meanwhile, Marceline, Count Almaviva's housekeeper, loves Figaro and hopes to ex also exploit a large debt Figaro owes her by conning him into marrying her, potentially nullifying the debt. Figaro, amused by the devilry surrounding him, turns to the nobility against each other, acting the puppeteer, even as he slowly loses control of his own schemes. All ends in Figaro's favor when it is revealed that Bartolo, a doctor from Seville, and Marceline are Figaro's parents, and Count Almaviva is outwitted by Rosina and Susanna. The plot of the marriage of Figaro, which places servants and nobility on equal ground, showed nobility manipulated by servants and satirized politics and the judiciary, ensuring the play would encounter success throughout Europe where unrest over the aristocracy had been broiling for years. The Marriage of Figaro was considered the most salacious of Beaumarchais' three plays and censored across Europe due to its subversive political content. Louis XVI, in fact, banned this public, uh, public performance of uh, Figaro when he learned of its political contents, but allowed a semi-private court staging that occurred in September, 1783. And the play was finally staged for the French public on April 27, 1784 to great success. Soon afterward, printed copies began to circulate Europe and by the time Mozart's opera was performed, there were several German translations and performances planned for Vienna in February, 1785. And while the presence of pirated copies and what was essentially a game of telephone for transmitting this play is not necessarily important for what I'm presenting now, it will be important later for determining what copy this manuscript's libretto was based on, because there are three um, model copies that most copies of um, manuscript copies of Figaro have been based. It may have been Mozart's idea to create an operatic staging of Figaro. Uh, and by 1786, Mozart had moved to Vienna after his dismissal from Archbishop Colorado's employment in Salzburg and sought to poke fun at the nobility, who if anybody might remember from the film Amadeus, he strongly resented for the power they exerted over his compositions. In Vienna, intellectual freedom was supported by Emperor Joseph II, who believed openness to criticism was the only avenue to political reform. However, while Joseph II had reduced censorship, he initially banned the marriage of Figaro from Vienna. So the play was only available in pirated German language copies. Uh, another composer, Paisiello, 
uh, his opera, The Barber of Seville, which was based on Beaumarchais' first play, had been hugely successful in Vienna. And The Marriage of Figaro was even more scandalous, which inspired Mozart's decision to com compose an operatic adaptation. Given the popularity of the play, Mozart and his librettists uh, worked quickly to produce Figaro before another composer seized the opportunity. The play was made, uh, uh, the two made a series of cuts to make the six act play better fit an operatic structure, which is commonly four acts, and temper its political impact so opera would be, the opera would be approved by Joseph II and the Viennese censors. Da Ponte further distanced the opera from the play by stating in his preface to the libretto that it was an adaptation of Beaumarchais' play rather than a direct translation. Mozart's opera was staged at Vienna's Burg Theater, which had been nationalized by Joseph II, which means Joseph II had complete control over what is performed at the, at the opera house. Uh, it premiered in May 1786, and scholars have disagreed whether the total of nine initial Viennese performances indicate a lukewarm reception. However, it is known that the 1786 Figaro score received backlash for its Act Three ballet, which is notated as a Fandango, a Spanish dance, but of course the ballet is a French dance, which the theater director tore out, saying the emperor won't have ballets in his theaters. However, Joseph II did eventually allow the theater to hire some dancers and allowed the ballet for three performances. And it's worth noting here that the RCS Figaro does actually contain the Fandango, um, although it does also contain the following stage notes that I have posted up here, which probably a little difficult to read. And they translate loosely to containing dance, nota bene, change to the end of act three from Note di Figaro. Figaro was next performed in Prague in 1786, where it was considered to have enjoyed a more successful run. It next moves throughout Italian speaking regions, including Monza, with significant changes to the score, Florence, and then returned to Vienna, Vienna for a revival in 1789, and then to Turin in 1811, Naples in 1814, and Milan in 1815. And as a side note, the three um, models or Borlaug uh, copies, manuscript copies of this opera that generally serve as models for all the copies that came after them are the original um, 1786 performance in Vienna, the Prague 1786 um, performance, and the Vienna 1789 performance. So here's a list of Marco Bergelli's excellent compilation of all Figaro performances in Italy during the 19th century, which will be essential to further understanding of the location and purpose of RCS Figaro's copying. And I'm going to make a slight guess that I suspect this copy most likely originated in an Italian theater copy shop sometime during the first quarter of the 19th century. So Milan Teatro di Canobiana in 18, uh, or sorry, the one before that, uh, Torino Teatro di Anginis in 1826 or earlier are the most likely sources. So I'd like to apologize for the low quality of these watermark photos. It was the best I could do under the circumstances. Uh, musicologists have disagreed on how closely a manuscript can be dated based on observations of its paper quality and watermarks, uh, with possibilities that range from within five to 20 years of the manuscript's creation. Furthermore, watermarks have long been disregarded as ineffective in dating music manuscripts. Although that practice has been strenuously defended by scholars who have relied on paper typing to produce new chronologies and dates for Mozart's manuscripts. Paper type is, of course, a term coined by Alan Tyson in his studies of Mozart and Beethoven autograph fragments, and it's the combination of the watermarks and rastra. Tyson reasoned that because watermarks and rastra are unique, they can be used to trace the manuscript's creator and ascertain the date and location of where the paper was used. Musicologists have taken a variety of approaches to recreate and analyze watermarks, including tracings, light X-ray radiation, hyperspectral imaging, and of course, photography, and against light sources like a window or an LED light panel, which is cheap and accessible. 
Photographic reproductions are useful because they can be used support to support cataloging of watermarks in music manuscripts by making more watermark images accessible for researchers to view when they cannot access physical manuscripts. For this study, I took photographs of Arceus Figaro with a smartphone camera while the paper was held against a window as the light source. The images were then manipulated digitally to enhance the appearance of each watermark, although I believe every photograph of the watermarks I have here have not been digitally manipulated unless I've zoomed in. All examination of the manuscript was done visually. The paper in RCS Figaro was produced in large sheets, which would then be folded into quartos so that each leaf is one quarter of the original, which was common for music paper produced during the late 18th century. And then to construct the manuscript, the paper was then folded twice and then cut horizontally, which unfortunately results in the watermarks being cut in half. This creates a substantial challenge to finding and identifying the watermarks in RCS Figaro because the lining up of where the watermarks were cut diff is different among each piece of paper. Tyson demonstrates in his diagrams and tracings of Mozart autographs how manuscript watermarks were commonly bisected. And I don't know if you can tell here, but this is again the image of the eagle or phoenix. And at the very bottom part are his feet. And underneath that, I believe, is his, uh, are his tail feathers, which have been cut off. So in RCS Figaro, at least three watermarks have been identified here, uh, the eagle or the phoenix, and underneath which uh, are the, possibly the initials BG. I also found a single man on the moon, which was a common watermark, and a set of three letters, possibly Cs. It is likely that the eagle slash BG slash man on the moon are all from the same paper, while the set of three Cs is from a different sheet of paper. Here, if you look closely at the center of the page, you may be able to make out the vague outline of either an eagle or a phoenix. Um, I'm gonna try to zoom in a bit and outline them. Here's the feet, the wings, and then this is the head, and another wing. And unfortunately, all the images of the phoenixes that I was able to find were on pages where it was just covered with music. So there's a lot of extra noise that I wasn't able to eliminate in the photos. So here are what I believe to be the initials BG. Um, and above them, uh, which would be to the right of the page, is a slight doodle, if I could call it that, of what I believe is the bottom of the um, eagle or phoenix's tail feathers. So here is uh, the man on the mood watermark, which is also on the right edge of the page. And you can see the outline of an object curling down and in inward. So this is possibly half of the man on the moon watermark. And you can also clearly see the chain lines that are used in the paper making process on this page. And again, if you look at the right side of right edge of this photo, you can see the faint outline of what are possibly three C's. Um, I'm not willing to stake my life on that because all the C's have been very much cut off. Um, so it could be other letters, I just can't tell. So I also did a handwriting analysis. Uh, the handwriting analysis is heavily reliant on unquantifiable impressions, unfortunately. However, identifying the number of hands present in RCS Figaro could help determine whether the music was copied under supervision at a copy shop or by an independent copyist. Studies on musical handwriting have resulted in systematic analyses of regional and personal characteristics in written musical symbols, including clefts, braces, dynamics, accidentals, rests, stems, and note heads. Don't worry, I won't show you too many musical symbols. Um, 
Edge summarizes most scholarship on musical handwriting in Mozart's Viennese copyist, in which he finds that each study is systematic in its own way. He further synthesizes the most effective methods used by these previous scholars and sets forth a methodology for analyzing musical handwriting, relying primarily on musical symbols, since it cannot be assumed that the handwriting text and music were necessarily the same. The conclusions I have here are based on a visual inspection of the text to discern the number of copyists and the regional penmanship styles, which I uh, also analyzed in consultation with Mr. Edge. Two hands contributed to the title page of RCS Figaro Act One. Uh, you'll see them here as title page, title A and title B. Their hands are different um, from those who con contributed to the score, uh, which can be seen in their idiosyncratic florist presentational depictions of the words. In comparison with the utilitarian hands in the body of the manuscripts, which we'll see, you'll see through copyists A through D, um, and which means, which indicates this manuscript was likely copied with supervision um, by a number of copyists, which was a common practice in theater copy, shop, copy shops during the early 19th century. So with no knowledge of the original cover, binding, or other components that have been removed, I can't look for other indicators to definitively conclude whether RCS Figaro was copied for publication or for performance. Um, these other indicators would include any presence of the printer's or publisher's initial, whether it was printed, whether that is printed or handwritten, a title page that clearly lists the contents of the score, contemporary indications of a specific destination for the manuscript, and a statement of price. Um, so like I said before, uh, the two title page uh, hands are title A and title B. Neither appear in the rest of the manuscript. And I should note that only title A is the hand that wrote out the full title of uh, The Marriage of Figaro. And it's the most stylized of any of the hands I found. Um, RCS Figaro contains at least four distinct copyists for the body of the score, all of whom appear to have copied both the music and the text that corresponded with each other, although it was not unusual to use separate copyists for both notation and text. And so I have here a comparison of all the hands currently observed in the manuscript. Each copyist is lettered in order of appearance. In order to discern the different copyists, I compared capital F, S, and V for each. And I should note also uh, the top line is all, of, all the Fs, but title B is supposed to be a V and not an F. Um, so shouldn't be on that line there. Each copyist treated the arms of the Fs differently, some plainly like copyist B and D and others with great flourish as with copyists A and C, and of course, title A. Likewise, each copyist treated their S differently. Copyists C and D were more likely to use a long S um, that is present in copyist D's Susanna. And the influence of Italian copybooks can be seen in the hands of each of them. Copyist B's S closely resembles the S in Gio, Giovacchino Frosini's um, copybook as do the F from copyists A, B, and C. All, of four, all four produce a version of Frosini's B. And unfortunately, I don't have samples of that copy book. I really wish I did. Um, copyist D's hand more closely resembles the less stylized letters in another copy book, also in Northern Italy, which is most apparent in his treatment of the long S and F. So just a little bit about the music. So the music was noted by at least the same four copyists uh, I discussed previously and confirms the conclusion that RCS Figaro was copied in Italy at the turn of the 19th century. Again, because this was a very common practice in theater copy shops at the time. The bass clef, uh, which you see in the middle there, which is C-shaped, uh, is noted by all the copyists written like an uppercase letter C, which is the reverse of the norm today, which you can see on the far left. This was not unknown in music notated by composers north of Italy, and it was much more common in professional Italian copies. Uh, regarding the C clef, which is at the top, 
Each copyist had his own distinct personal style, but they all had commonalities as well. All have two shorter horizontal lines on each side of the C-clef of the staff and a downward curving line to the right that denotes a family resemblance that is similar yet distinct from the typical Viennese C-clef. Additionally, it was unusual for Austrian and Viennese copyists to write the stems and flags of quavers, which you'll see at the bottom, in a single strongly curved stroke, which you'll see in uh, all these samples. They're all one long stroke, although it was common for composers. Each of these notational char uh, characteristics support a conclusion that RCS figure was copied in an Italian coffee shop. So based on the preceding examination, it is likely RCS Figaro is a professional early 19th century performance score created at the copy shop of an Italian theater. This conclusion is based on the high quality Northern Italian paper, the watermarks and presence of at least four hands, the performance notes and the bits of English translation, along with what is known to have been common practice at that time. But what does this mean for the RCS Figaro's presence in Scotland? Well, if I'm correct in determining this manuscript was copied in the first quarter of the 19th century, this means there is only about 100 years during which the manuscript would have made its way to Scotland. If the conservator's name changed in 1944 is the outer limit in the timing of its acquisition. This means the manuscript falls squarely within the long 19th century's massive activity in manuscripts traveling from continental Europe to Scotland and England. During this time, a myriad of individuals could have carried the manuscript to Scotland, perhaps an impresario intent on staging the opera at Scotland's most esteemed music academy, or an antiquarian collector who valued performance scores, or maybe a book and music trader seeking to sell the manuscript to a shop. Internationally and domestically, music and books were traded alongside each other at book and print shops, emporiums, and book fairs, where booksellers and, and the public could meet and trade. Scotland's place within the landscape of Western art music, however, is ambiguous and unstudied relative to its book tradition. The primary flaw in studies of Scottish music is the incomplete handling of Scotland's importation of art music, which is defined as music that is not folk music, from the continent through the long 19th century. Scholars have widely considered Scotland to be a hostile, quote unquote, barren landscape for art music performance, and studies of music in Scotland during the 19th and 20th centuries have generally focused on music that is defined as Scottish, so primarily folk music, and so this focus primarily on folk music and music that originated in Scotland and not music that came from without. This means most studies of so-called art music in Scotland are relatively limited as our studies of the music manuscript trade in Scotland. However, art music was certainly concerned by the Scottish public and the conservatory's growth paralleled Scotland's expanding involvement in art music and music was disseminated or published in manuscript form, especially opera, as frequently as printed music during the majority of the 19th century. While my conclusions regarding the origins of this manuscript are relatively solid, even with my limited resources, and my conclusions regarding how the manuscript got to Scotland arguably dissatisfying, this also illuminates the dearth of knowledge regarding the trade of music manuscripts in Scotland during a time when trade routes opened and Scottish theaters sought to bring opera to the public. It also shows the rich opportunity for future research into this area of study, which I think is one of the most exciting characteristics of this lovely score that is held by the Royal Conservatory of Scotland. Thank you. I could take questions. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Jessica. Um, that's very, very interesting. <laughs> do we do we have any questions? Um, um, now we have a question here from um, Bob um, Kozowski. Um, would you like to ask it yourself or do you want me to ask it? Um, 
silence. <laughs> um, <Okay>. So, a <laughs> question here: um, Did you think of? Oh, right. I can ask it. Right. Um, did you think of looking at the performance history of Figaro in the UK? I did, um, and I, I actually I, I did investigate it um, a bit. And so I've mostly presented on the second chapter of my dissertation today. Um, I covered a little bit of um, the first chapter towards the end of uh, this talk. Um, so I did explore performance history in the UK. Um, I found some information on performance in England. Um, and I mentioned briefly, I think at the beginning that uh, the opera had taken a very different form once it got to uh, London in 1812 uh, or 11, I believe. Um, and what happened is that since all these operas, generally the tradition is that all the operas are in Italian and um, English um, audiences were not interested in um, things staying in the original uh, language, or at least that was the assumption. So it was translated and then it had also been cut quite a bit. Um, so it was a very, um, well, I guess one could say like choppy and shortened version of the opera. Um, I could not find much um, information on performances of uh, like full performances of uh, Figaro in Scotland, unfortunately. I did see that there had been some uh, performances here and there at um, the, well, the conservatoire um, under its former names, um, but no full performances that would have required a full score. But at the same time, um, if the score, this is just me postulating, if the score had come to Scotland um, sometime during like the late 19th century, early 20th century, which was when the, their conservatory's vocal program um, really started to expand, um, that could explain why there's English translations in only certain parts of uh, the score here. Um, unfortunately, I'd have to go back and look to see exactly which arias, uh, which are the full on singing part portions of the opera and um, or which part or which recitatives, which is the part that sounds more like speaking. Um, I'd have to see if they were possibly the more um, popular ones. Um, just off the top of my head, I can so if I can if I go back, actually, so this one right here, here's a um, here's one of the um, translations. And if you can see it, it says, tell me, does my headdress suit you, I think. Um, and this here, all of these really short um, quavers here indicates that this is a recitative, which would be a more um, speaking sound. Um, and I, but I don't know just from looking at this, if it's one of the more popular ones that would have been performed just by the vocal program at the conservatoire. Um, so I'd like I'd like to look more into the performance history at some point. <laughs> it's a long, sorry, that was long. <laughs> uh, oh dear, I've now lost the half the questions. Um, struggling with the little box for the questions. Um, now there's a question from Karen McCauley. Do you want to ask that yourself? If you're able to unmute Karen. Okay, here I am. Yeah, I just wondered, I was looking at that handwriting and I was wondering whether by any chance the English could be William Whitaker, William Gillies Whitaker's handwriting. And I wondered whether you might have considered asking Stuart to compare. I don't even know who that is. So I'm going to have to ask. He was the first principal. He, he was the first principal who round about 1929 was the principal both of the um, the the Nas Scottish National Academy of Music, as it was then, and the music department in the university. Okay, I'm writing that down. Thank you. So <laughs> it might be worth just, just comparing that. I mean, there were various people it could have been, but it occurred to me that since he was the first sort of principal of both, then okay. there is a possibility that it could have his handwriting. Okay. That was one observation. And the other thing is, 
had you noticed it at the back of the score? I, I forget whether it's at the back of each of the four volumes or whether it's just back of one, but they've got separate scores for the harmonia, the wind parts. Oh, um, so there is... So they, if they would have been written out originally for the wind instruments. It's called the harmonia, but it, that's what it is, it's the wind parts. And they, yeah. they, they're either at the back of each of the four volumes or they're all at the back of one. I can't remember because it's 20 years since I saw it. But I, it, yeah. it might be worth bearing in mind that there, there were these extra parts at one point. They're, they're all together, as I recall. I don't think they're separately for different instruments. But you so need to look I, more closely to remind yourself. I did find um, in the, I think it was the third act, um, uh, there was a separate part for the finale for the um, for the wind instruments. Um, and it actually threw me because I couldn't figure out what it went with for a second until I realized it was just all the wind separate from everything else. But yeah. I didn't notice yeah. in the other three. Yeah, I can't remember. I mean, I was the one that took it for it. I took it on the, on the train, I think it was, down to see oh. the British Library and see what I could find out about it. So oh, yes. I since, since I, I mean, I'm the one that deposited it in the university library because it seemed to me it was too valuable just to have it in our library until we had a proper archive. And then Stuart got it back when we had got a proper archive. So yeah, it's, it's had its struggles, yes. Yeah. But luckily, it was very nicely preserved while I was in uh, the University of Glasgow. Yeah. So yeah. Yes, a, a question from, um, from me, looking at it and comparing it with the sort of material that Edinburgh was acquiring from the middle of the 19th century onwards for the music department, they do seem in Edinburgh to have been quite eclectic and have been building up a, a music library quite, you know, quite systematically at that point. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether it was just acquired as something else that would be useful to be studied um, or whether it was given to them. Yeah, I've I've wondered that myself. I also wondered. Um, unfortunately, I don't know the history of, you know, the practice of studying opera manuscripts um, in the 19th century specifically. Um, so that would be a, an interesting area to explore as far as like what what scholars. At the you know, at the conservatoire would have been interested in at that time, um, or if it really you know maybe that yeah maybe they did just acquire it um, just for the sake of having it or for future study and then someone checked it out and wrote in it. Also a possibility. <laughs> yes, I mean somebody could have written it written in it at a later date. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, Karen, Karen says it could quite easily have been a gift and that yeah, the focus yeah. was more on performance and musicology in the early, early years. Mm -hmm. um, yes, it might be it might be interesting to compare some of the Edinburgh holdings, you know, sort of Edinburgh purchasing, because we've got purchasing records. Okay. Um, of some sort, I think. Um, and I've wondered, I, I didn't have a, the ability to look into any kind of purchasing records that um, the conservatoire had. Um, I didn't think to push to see if they, you know, they just said they had nothing. Um, but there might be something somewhere that, you know, people aren't aware, aware of. Uh, yes, I think there's another another message appearing somewhere. Ah, oh. oh, that's Karen again, who says she's not aware of anything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, oh. Yes, I do feel for you with the watermarks. <laughs> As we, we have occasionally done watermark, watermark inquiries with, with very, very small formats. They've been looking for sort of, you know, like sort of spider legs across 
yeah. <laughs> quarters of pages. Yeah, when I learned that it was common for the watermarks to be cut in half in the music manuscripts, I was like, no, <laughs> I'll never figure this out. <laughs> Yes, it look it looks fascinating, and there must be an answer of somebody who has had access to it somewhere. Um, yeah. Hmm. Just wondering whether there's any any more questions. There must be. There must be. No, I keep getting. Awkward little box. Yet, would there have been any possible sort of student student study performances? Um, <laughs> possible. I'm trying to remember my research into the student performances. Um, so the thing that has um, kind of affected my um, study of it was that it appears that, the, you know, the conservatoire is a music conservatory, so the focus is mostly on the performance and not necessarily the historiographic study plus the performance. Um, so while there have been student performances, having come from um, schools where there were majority of performers performers if you're there for for performance you're not necessarily there to actually do a historical study at the same time um that's very a very broad generalization <laughs> um so it's quite possible that somebody may have wanted to do like a study and a performance of it but most likely if it was performed um it was probably just for the sake of performing um I could be completely wrong, though. Um, yes, the comment here from um, Bob, Bob um, Kozowski uh, says he recalls a, a talk by Alan Tyson, where he said that the study of manuscript copies such as this is very important for the study of dissemination. So mm -hmm. bravo for studying the manuscript. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, Tyson's was Tyson's work was very important. I actually looked at um, his. I was just stabbing in the dark, and uh, um, I looked at his catalog of the Mozart autographs just to just to see. Um, but of course, all the paper that Mozart for he he did all tracings, and they're huge. It's a huge catalog of his um, of his autographs that uh, that Tyson traced. Um, so, but unfortunately, most of the paper there. Um, well, first of all, Mozart was mostly uh, active in a different region in Vienna, so he would have used different paper than this paper here. Um, and also a lot of that paper was from um, earlier manuscripts, more from like the late 18th century. Like, um, so uh, there was a lot of, it was very clear that it was, that it was um, earlier watermarks. Um, however, I did learn from those that there were families of watermarks that existed for music manuscript papers, such as like the triple C's um, and then the um, variety of man and the moon watermarks that I think is common in a lot of different types of paper. Yes, and if those watermarks are related to the size of the paper, they're something that you don't see a lot on other types of book. Yeah, I would would imagine because they're, they're not familiar from dealing with printed text. Yeah, yeah, so this that's is, true. This is obviously music paper. Mm -hmm. um, yes, it's a real mystery. <laughs> um, oh, was was Mozart being played? And performed in Britain in in the form of, of single arias or single short pieces and extracts from the operas rather than the full operas um, in the 19th yes. century. Yes, off and on. Um, 
yeah, mostly, mostly in, uh, mostly in chopped up arias and such, and like, and single performances by, uh, um, by famous um, singers. Um, and I can't remember off the top of my head if um, uh, Britain um, is part of this, but um, Mozart uh, kind of lost popularity towards the middle of the um, 19th century, which you can see from these performance, this performance history in Italy. Um, you know, there was a break between 1826 and 1869, and then there's another break until 1899. Um, this is just performances of the full um, Marriage of Figaro opera, but in general, he, he became less popular in Europe um, during the late 19th century, and it wasn't until probably the, I think like the mid 20th century maybe that he started to become more, more popular. Um, more people started um, looking into his autographs and I don't remember the reason why, but um, then he, then he picked up, you know, more popularity and he's performed, you know, all over the place now. Yes, it's the, it's, it seems to have been a sort of trajectory from superstar to obscurity back to superstar. <laughs> yeah. And I think um, I think Britain, you know, followed that trend as well, especially because, you know, opera was considered like an Italian thing. It's different from what you have there. So it took some time for that to kind of take take hold. So it would be would have been chopped up into bite sized pieces. And then as you know, performances of art music, so called art music kind of picked up steam, especially in the 20th century um in Britain then then Mozart would have been performed more especially like in full in full score yes are there any more questions um just it would be great silence from everybody <laughs> Well, if anybody um, has any other questions that they think of later or um, input that I, you know, any clues I can follow, um, I have my um, email up there. Yes, any suggestions? Because somebody may have seen the handwriting or <laughs> yeah. something like it. There is, Karen mm -hmm. says that they're just all overawed by the manuscript. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and it is it is utterly awesome <laughs> yeah <laughs> um oh our cat has just appeared <laughs> slightly damp <laughs> um so i think we should at this point give jessica the traditional round of applause it will go completely unheard <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, one of the shortcomings of Zoom. <laughs> um, yes, there's some talk, some comments coming in saying brilliant talk. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> um, um, lots of interested people, as possibly just not very many musicians in the audience. Yes, I tried to keep it focused only on the non-music mm. aspect. <laughs> yes. Yes, I mean the the you know the idea of the coffee shop and people working on it, several people working on it in in parallel is fascinating. Yes, it, um, I didn't like, get too much into it in the talk, um, but part of the reason they did this was to what would happen is the theater an impresario would source a copy of the manuscript that the theater has decided to perform. They'd bring it to the coffee shop where all these copyists are working together at the same um, as quickly as possible to copy it. And then that copy that they make is now that theater's copy. And then the impresario might, you know, another theater might borrow it or um, buy it. And so they travel all over the place. And that's one of the reasons why learning a study, full study of the entire manuscript is necessary because of, I mentioned in the, in the talk, um, there's three 
like um, three families basically of um, Figaro um, manuscripts that exist. And I have not been able to discern yet which family this one belongs to. Well, good luck with your future researches on it. And it's it's lovely to see you again after <laughs> it's lovely to see you too. over a year. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just to um, remind everybody um, here tonight that our next talk is on the 18th of November, when we'll be hearing from Catherine Holderith um, on books of the Scottish female religious during the late medieval period. Um, and um, a reminder or an announcement that that also will be on Zoom. Um, the programme has that one down as being live at the Quaker Meeting House, but that will not be the case. Um, and thank you all for coming. And thank Jessica very much indeed. Thank you um, for having me. <laughs> and I think um, that I think concludes this evening's meeting. Thank you for coming. <laughs>